Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Philip. I work at Compass Security and it is my pleasure today to talk to you about some products that I've came across while working there. So what kind of products am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about products that allow you to log into your Windows using only your smartphone. So basically, the user sits in front of the lock screen, the user presses Control alt delete enters his username, the user gets a notification from the app that the user's installed, basically saying you want to log in, yes or no. The user presses yes, and the user is logged in. And the user did not need to enter the annoying password. And you can think of this sort of as a new or modern iteration of the smart card login, but instead of the smart card, you have your smartphone, basically. In this talk, I'm going to go over three products that I looked at. For each of these three products, I'm going to show you how they work under the hood, so basically how they achieve this login without a password. And then I'm also going to show off one vulnerability for each product that basically allows a non-privileged attacker user to abuse some mechanism in these products to log in as another user. Now, when I'm talking about uh, logging into Windows without the password, you might be thinking of Windows Hello and how this sort of fits into what I'm talking about. There's basically two big differences between the products I'm talking about and Windows Hello. First difference is all the products I'm talking about are third-party products. Windows Hello is by Microsoft. Second bigger difference is that Windows Hello is really bound to one computer. So your Windows Hello pin or biometric is meaningless on like any computer besides your own as opposed to these uh, smartphone passwordless logins where your smartphone can really be used to log into any domain joint computer. So here's the uh, involved parties in these products. We've got the smartphone, the server, as well as the computer, and we also have the domain controller. Now, of course, when you're logging into your computer, you're also authenticating yourself in, in the context of like an Active Directory corporate network. You're authenticating yourself to the main controller so you can then access the network resources afterwards. And of course, when you're logging in with these passwordless products, you also want to be able to afterwards access these uh, network resources. And that's why the domain controller is in brackets because this part really does not change. So really the main functionality is implemented on the smartphone, on the server, and on the computer. Now, when these products are installed on a computer, how do they sort of execute their code when a user wants to log in? And basically, the way they do it is they install a custom credential provider. So a credential provider in the context of the Windows login is basically a DLL that is referenced by some registry entries. And Windows basically looks up these registry entries and loads the DLL into every login process that is started. And so when this, such a product is installed on a computer, they also install a credential provider, and this way they hook themselves into every login process that is started. Now, usually these products also install a service which uh, communicates with the credential provider over IPC, and the service is usually the one that then talks to the server over uh, HTTPS, HTTPS usually. What's interesting about these uh, credential providers is that these credential providers don't have the power to actually validate credentials. So their purpose is to gather credentials and pass them to the rest of the uh, login process where they will be validated later on by the underlying Windows implementation. And so now there's a bit of a problem because you, you, these products run in the context of the credential provider, so they don't have the power to validate credentials, but the user is not entering any credentials because, of course, that's the entire point of these products is that the user does not enter credentials. So how can these uh, products actually authenticate the user? And that's basically where uh, the main point of this slide comes in, is that these products cache valid user credentials at some place. And then basically, so, so the main thing that these products really implement is caching user credentials somewhere and then unlocking them and passing them to the credential provider DLL once the user has sort of authorized the login on their app. And I guess I got lucky because all the three products that I looked at cache their credentials at a different place. And this is really like the main design decision uh, when, you, when this product is built because this has a huge impact on the user experience as well as on like how it works under the hood and of course how you would go about attacking it. So SafeNet caches them on the computer, Viridium AD on the server, and Hyper caches them on the smartphone itself. Now, we are done with the introduction. Now I'm going to go through each of these products, show you how they work, and show you the vulnerability. First off is Talus SafeNet. 
So for the user experience, basically the user installs the SafeNet app, scans a QR code that he gets from the uh, organization, and then he basically has a smartphone en enrolled for a user. Now, if the user wants to log into a computer with SafeNet, the user basically goes up to the computer, enters the username, gets a notification on the app saying you want to log in, yes or no. The user clicks yes, and then if it's the first time the user logs into that computer, the user needs to enter uh, his password. If the user then basically logs in a second time, the user gets the notification, but then the user does not have to enter the password anymore. So the, basic, the user basically has to enroll himself to a computer if he wants to log in without the password afterwards. And you might already think, you know, have an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Basically what's happening is the credential provider DLL by SafeNet takes the password entered the first time, encrypts it, and then writes it to a file on disk. So this is what you see here behind those black bars are basically uh, base64 uh, strings of the uh, ciphertext passwords. And this is just a file that's stored somewhere in the installation directory. And of course, when you log in without the password, the credential provider DLL by SafeNet reads this file, decrypts the password, and then passes it back to the login process. And this way, the user is basically logged in without having to enter the password. Now, this file is readable for all users. Keep that in mind. This will be more relevant later on. So, of course, I was very interested when I was looking at this is uh, I can read the file. I can read the ciphertext. Can I decrypt these passwords? So here's sort of the debugging setup. I have a USC prompt started. That's basically my login process. And you can see that uh, constant.exe, this is the USC process, and below are the uh, DLLs that are loaded, and this crypto card credential provider DLL is the credential provider DLL that was basically installed by SafeNet. And now if I want to figure out how these passwords are uh, decrypted, I just have to uh, see what this DLL is doing, basically. So this is what you see here. This is a API monitor capture. So this just captures Windows API calls while I basically logged in with SafeNet. And you can see marked in red is a call to crypt unprotect data. And below that is a black bar. And that's basically my plain text password. Now crypt unprotect data is part of the Windows data protection API. And the idea here uh, of this API is basically that a user can encrypt something on a computer, and only the user that has encrypted that data can then decrypt it. So Windows basically enforces some access control on the encryption key. So, you know, the assumption here is that they use this Windows Data Protection API to encrypt the passwords, encrypt and decrypt them. So I was interested in how it actually gets encrypted. So I just threw in the DLL into Ghidra, searched for crypt protect data, and there's one reference. And uh, yeah, basically what's interesting here is that the flex parameter is set to five. And if this is set to five, then the third bit is set to one. And this means the local machine flag is set. And this means that all the protections of the Windows Data Protection API are basically void because if this flag is set, then any user on the computer can decrypt uh, something that was encrypted with this local machine flag. And now you might be wondering what's stopping a user to just read this file and decrypt the passwords of other users that have logged into this computer with SafeNet. So there's one small complication. Um, SafeNet uses this entropy, which is basically just like an encryption, para encryption password for the crypt, uh, unprotect and crypt protect uh, data uh, function API. But this is static, so I just logged in a bunch of times. The value was always the same. And it turns out there's a uh, suspicious looking base64 string in the DLL. And if you follow this basically from uh, source to sync, it always ends up in the crypt unprotect or crypt protect uh, parameter as the entropy. So long story short, what do you end up with? Well, what you end up with is a vulnerability where a, a user on the machine without any admin privileges can basically just decrypt the passwords of other users that have logged into this computer. So this is just my uh, little PowerShell proof of concept where I pasted in the base64 uh, password ciphertext. And if you run this, you can basically decrypt the passwords of all other users. So I think this is pretty nasty. And uh, this was disclosed to Talos, and they tried to fix it. But the first time they fixed, tried to fix it is they failed. So they just added another layer of encryption, but they did not fix the underlying issue. So the underlying issue of using local machine was still present. They just uh, basically now stored the encrypted passwords in an encrypted database and added a new DLL to manage this encrypted database. But well, you can just write like an executable that imports this new DLL, makes a function call, makes some function calls. There's like an exported call by this DLL called get ca ad cache creds. So, you know, imagine what this does. And, you know, you can again just 
run this executable. Well, this screenshot's not too great, but you can see I'm just running this executable with a user security identifier, and if that user has used SafeNet to log into that computer, then I get that user's password. Now, you might be wondering what's going on here. Why, why are they using local machine? Why is the file readable for all users? And, well, I didn't state this before explicitly, but these uh, passwordless products, basically, um, they support login uh, from the lock screen, login for the UAC prompt, and SafeNet, the only one, supports a login for the Windows run as different user function. So this is like shift right click, and there's the function. And the thing about this is that the login process that has started here is actually started by the explorer process. And the explorer process, of course, runs with your normal user permissions as, of, as opposed to the UAC prompt or the login from the lock screen, which runs as system. And so what this means is that the SafeNet credential provider DLL is loaded with normal permissions into this uh, run as different user login process. But if you want to support passwordless login for this run as different user login process, the DLL needs to somehow be able to decrypt the passwords. And that's why the, the file is readable for all users and they're using local machine because they want to support this run as different user login without the password for their SafeNet application. And so basically, if any product like this supports the like, default Windows run as different user function for passwordless login, then it's basically vulnerable by design. In the newest version, or newer version, they added a registry key. If it's set to one, then basically they will now do the encryption without the local machine flag, and the vulnerability here that I showed is fixed. But I was told that this, this uh, value is actually not set to one by default, so by default it's still basically vulnerable to what I talked about before. Okay, next product, a Viridium AD. So here the user again installs the Viridium AD app and rolls it for his user, and then unlike SafeNet and unlike the product afterwards, the user does not actually have to enroll himself to a computer if the user wants to log in without entering the password. So the user just goes up to any domain joint computer, enters his username, gets the notification, says yes, and the user is logged in, so there's no need to sort of enroll. What's going on? Well, after the user enters his username on a login process, the Viridium AD service will make a HTTP request to the Viridium AD server with the user security identifier. And the Viridium AD service, after sending this request, will also start polling the Viridium AD server to basically wait for the user to either approve this login or decline the login. Now, once the Viridium AD server receives this login, the Viridium AD server basically triggers the notification on the user's phone, saying you want to log in yes or no. In this case, the user presses yes, and if the, once the Viridium AD server receives that information, the server sends back the user's login certificate. And then the Viridium AD service receives that login certificate, so basically it gets sent as a response on one of those polling requests. And the service on the computer receives that certificate, passes it to the, uh, to the Viridium AD credential provider, and the Viridium AD credential provider passes that certificate to the login process, and now the user is basically logged in. There's actually a bit more going on here with the server. So basically there's a on-premise server, Viridium AD server, that exposes these API endpoints where basically the uh, Viridium AD uh, workstation, uh, where the computers can basically make these HTTP requests to pull or trigger push notifications. And the server talks to the, to the Active Directory certificate service and basically generates a user login certificates on demand. So when a user wants to log in, a new certificate is basically generated, so like a one-time certificate. But I abstract this to a credential stored on the server because that's how like, the smartphone and the computer sees it, basically. So how would you go about attacking this? Well, let's say there's an attacker in the internal network that can talk to this API of the Viridium AD server, well, how about just triggering push notifi triggering this notification for another user? So here you can see above is the HTTP post request that, is bas that basically triggers the notification on a user's phone. And what's marked in blue are basically the values that I modified. So here another, I basically specified another user's security identifier, and I also changed sort of the text of the notification. And when this is sent to the server, the server basically says activate it and gives me back a session ID. And this actually does trigger a notification on another user's phone, also with the uh, text from me. Now, I'm already in the internal network and talking to the API, so I can also just start polling the Viridium AD server myself. So basically, this is the polling request with the uh, session ID that you get when you trigger the notification. And here, the user has 
is it has actually fallen for this notification. So the user accepted it. So you get back this token, and you can basically exchange this token at the Viridium AD server for the user's login certificate. So I was so this way, if the user falls for this malicious push notification, I can get another user's login certificate. Now you might be wondering, okay, what's what's a login certificate good for? Well, basically, if you're in the internal network, you can use that login certificate to get yourself a Kerberos ticket granting ticket, or with some magic, get the user's NTLM hash. So it's not quite as nice as a password, but it's pretty much equivalent. Now, there's a small complication to this. So even though I'm in the internal network, I'm not able to directly talk to the Viridium AD server's API. It's actually protected by a client certificate. But of course, when I saw this, I, was, I wondered, okay, where does this client certificate actually come from? And so basically, when the Viridium AD service is restarted, on the computer, this HTTP request here is sent to the Viridium AD server to this uh, register device endpoint. And what's in there, or what's marked in blue, is a certificate signing request. And the server then returns the uh, SSL client certificate that can be used to authenticate to the endpoints that trigger the push notification or that can be used to pull. And what's nice here is that this uh, request here can be done by any domain user. So basically, to do this attack, you need, you need to be in the internal network and you need like the credentials of at least one normal, low-privileged domain user, and then you can basically mount the attack. So basically, first off, you generate the certificate signing request. So this is just, you just have to mimic what the server is sending, basically. You authenticate yourself with the low, uh, with this domain user to the uh, Viridium AD server. You get the SSL client certificate, and then you basically start triggering push notifications for arbitrary users. And if any of these users fall for such a malicious notification, you can get their login certificate by also polling the server. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is sort of um, because Viridium AD is the only product where it, the, the Viridium AD service can basically get the login credentials for any user because the user does not need to enroll himself. Uh, it's sort of difficult of, okay, how do you protect this endpoint? Well, okay, we use the client certificate, but how do you protect the endpoint that gets the client certificate? And sort of they failed there. So the way they fixed this is they basically restricted this endpoint that uh, signs the, that basically returns the client certificate such that only uh, computer accounts in a specific group can use this endpoint. And so now if you want to mount this attack, you need to basically compromise one of those computer accounts. Okay, so, ah, okay, so uh, last and final product, Hyper. So here, this works a bit differently. The user installs the Hyper app, logs into a computer, and then opens a desktop uh, application and scans a QR code in there. And then the user basically gets a button in his Hyper app that says like username and computer name. And the user can do this basically, can log into any computer and enroll himself for this Hyper login uh, on that computer with his user. And if the user wants to log in, the user just clicks the button in the app, and the user does not actually need to touch the keyboard. The computer will just automatically unlock and log in that user. How does it work? Well, basically, the hyper service on the computer is always pulling the hyper cloud server whenever there is a login process started. So the computer is locked or there's a USC prompt. And I also talked about this uh, in the beginning. Hyper caches the credentials on the smartphone. So what that, this means concretely is there's a login certificate that is stored on the uh, smartphone of the user. Now the user clicks uh, the unlock button for this computer up there, and the app will basically send some HTTPS requests to the Hyper Cloud server to initialize this login flow. So basically say which user wants to log in for which computer. Once this is done, the app encrypts this login certificate and sends it to the Hyper Cloud server. And the HyperCloud server basically forwards this uh, login certificate to the uh, computer by, uh, it basically gets sent as a response on one of those polling requests. And then the same thing happens as in Viridium AD. So the Hyper service receives this encrypted login certificate. Well, it's not quite the same, but it receives the encrypted login certificate, decrypts it, passes it to the Hyper credential provider, and the Hyper credential provider passes the certificate to the login process, and then the user is locked in. Now, some words about this uh, encrypted certificate. So basically, uh, there's a shared key between the smartphone and the computer. And it's basically, there's a Diffie-Hellman key exchange when the user basically scans this QR code on the desktop application. 
And basically, the smartphone encrypts the certificate, and the computer decrypts it, or the service on the computer decrypts it. And if you want to decrypt it, you either need to be a system on the computer, or you need to somehow, or you need to compromise the smartphone. And so this seems pretty secure, but there's a crack here, and it's that you can actually get encrypted login certificates of other users, and I will show later on how this can actually be then exploited to log in as another user. And maybe before I go forward, the attack scenario here is that there's a, an attacker who basically has code execution on a computer with a low-privileged user, and there is a, uh, another user on the computer, maybe a, a local administrator user, that is basically using Hyper to log into this computer. And the attacker is looking to obviously log in as that target user. So how can you get the encrypted login certificate of that target user? Well, basically, Hyper stores some data in the registry. So for every user that has basically enrolled his app to this computer, there is a registry key, and then there's some entries uh, which contain some parameters, and these parameters can actually be used to talk to the Hyper Cloud server on behalf of that user. And so basically, using... So, and these are readable for all users on the computer. So the access control is readable for our users. So the attacker can basically read these out and start polling the HyperCloud server himself. So this is what you see here. This is one of those polling requests sent directly to the HyperCloud server. And while the attacker is polling the server, if the user tries to log in during that time, the attacker basically gets that target user's encrypted login certificate. So this is the thing here marked in red, basically. Now, the attacker has an encrypted login certificate, but the attacker is not admin on the computer, so the attacker can decrypt the certificate. How can the attacker now manage this stolen certificate to log in? Well, basically, I'm going to show the entire attack, and then I'm going to show sort of the details afterwards. So here's sort of the setup. We've got the attacker with a low-privileged user on the computer. We have the attacker's smartphone, where the attacker has installed the Hyper app himself and has enrolled his own low-privileged user for Hyper login. And the attacker also has set up his smartphone to basically proxy all the HTTPS traffic to, through like an HTTPS proxy. So in my case, that was just burp. And um, obviously, the setup can be different for the attacker part, but that's the way I used it because I did not reverse engineer the uh, mobile app at all. I just basically tampered with the parameters sent in the HTTP REST requests. Now, the attacker starts a, a login uh, flow or a login prompt on the computer maybe a USC prompt because he wants to log in as the admin. And now the user basically clicks the unlock button for his user on this computer. Now the app is going to send these initialization HTTPS requests to the proxy, and the attacker is going to take these requests and modify the parameters in these requests such that at the end of step two, the hyper cloud server thinks that the target user is actually trying to log in, not the attacker user. And so now the app is going to send the encrypted login certificate of the attacker. The attacker is going to drop that request and basically send the stolen encrypted login certificate to the HyperCloud server. And again, the HyperCloud server is going to forward this to the Hyper service on the computer. And the Hyper service is going to basically decrypt that certificate for the attacker and log in the attacker as the target user. So this is basically how the attacker can leverage a stolen encrypted login certificate to log in as another user. Now, unfortunately, there's a complication, quite a severe one, actually, and that is this enc counter value here. This is a value that gets set by, this, by the Hyper Cloud server for every new login flow that is started for a user. Basically, on the left here, you can see uh, the request that is, sent by the, that is sent to the mobile app, and the mobile app takes this enc counter, prepends it to the login certificate, and then encrypts this, uh, sort of this data together. And then on the right side, you can see the response that is sent to the hyper service, and this also contains the enc counter value. And the hyper service will decrypt the received uh, ciphertext blob, and then basically compare the enc counter value received in the HTTP response to the one in the decrypted plain in the plain text. And if these don't match, the hyper service will abort this login process. And so this is an issue because when we stole the encrypted login certificate, we have now a static enc counter value, and this needs to somehow match the one of the, that the server sets, but we don't have any control over how the server sets this value, unfortunately. So a few words about this. this fortunately, this enc counter is not like a super random value. It actually starts at one and gets incremented for every new login flow that is started. But this is a problem because, of course, 
you know, we have now an encrypted login certificate with an end counter. Let's say it's like end counter two. But then any new login flow that is started for this target user is going to be and with an end counter three or greater. And that's never going to match the one of our stolen encrypted login certificate. But fortunately, there's a, a workaround. So a user can deregister de himself from a computer for the hyper login. So basically, the user can click a button in the app and say, I don't want to log into this computer with hyper anymore. So the user can do this on the desktop or on the mobile app. And then basically what happens is these registry uh, data that we saw before gets deleted. Now, what's interesting is that this end counter resets to one if the user basically deregisters from a computer and then re-registers. So if this happens, then the end counter is back to one, but the encryption key, the shared encryption key between the uh, smartphone of that user and the computer stays the same because basically like the Diffie-Hellman parts of the computer and the smartphone are like static. So you might have an idea of what, what the idea, what the workaround is. Basically, the attacker can use these registry values that we saw before to also deregister the target user. And then once the target user has re-registered, the end counter is back at one. And now the end counter is in a has a, is in a position where it can eventually match the end counter of the stolen encrypted login certificate. So just to sum up, this is basically the full attack. So the attacker first obtains this encrypted login certificate of the target user. The attacker deregisters the target user. The attacker waits for the target user to re-register. And then the attacker actually does this attack that I showed you before, where the attacker starts the login flow and inserts the stolen encrypted login certificate. So let's go through this in a bit more detail. So first off, this we've already seen. So the attacker reads out the registry values of the target user, pulls the server, and if the target user authenticates during that time with Hyper, the attacker steals that user's encrypted login certificate. Next step, with the values from the registry, the attacker just sends this HTTPS request to the server, and now the target user is deregistered from that computer for the Hyper login. So the next time the target user tries to log into that computer with Hyper, it's going to tell, it's, there's going to be like a pop-up saying, you're deregistered from that computer, you can't use Hyper to log in. And hopefully the target user likes using Hyper to log into that computer, and the target user re-registers. Now the attacker can basically just monitor the registry to basically wait until this, the target user's registry key is populated again. So then the attacker knows the target user has re-registered. And now the target user's end counter is back at one, and the target and the encryption key is still the same, so now the attacker can reuse the stolen encrypted login certificate. So this is what the attacker is doing now. So here's basically the first HTTPS request that is triggered by the app. And the attacker is going to modify two values in here, the machine username and the device ID. Basically, machine username is going to be changed to the target user. Machine is going to be the same. And the device ID is read from the registry and basically just identifies the user's uh, smartphone. The server is going to respond with some values. Once these values are received by the app, there's going to be a biometrics prompt, which the attacker, of course, passes because it's, a, it's his own smartphone. And then there's going to be some values sent to the server. And the server is going to send back the session ID the app is going to send that session ID to the server, and now this is the point where basically the HyperCloud server sets the end counter value. And at this point, the attacker can look at this end counter value and compare it to the one of the stolen encrypted login certificate. If it matches, then the attacker goes forward with the attack. If it does not, the attacker just repeats, like, the, like this HTTP, just starts a new login flow and keeps going, keeps incrementing the end counter until it matches the one of the stolen encrypted login certificate. So let's say it matches. Now the attacker just sends the, encrypted, the stolen encrypted login certificate to the HyperCloud server, and the HyperCloud server is going to give a nondescript response here. Authorization performed successfully. And of course, what's happening in the background, we've already seen that, and the attacker is going to basically be locked in as the target user. So, of course, needs some interaction, but still think it's pretty cool. What's the problem? Well, there's three problems here. There's this repeating encryption nonce that's not really super random. So if this value was le really never repeating or was like a super random value, then it would be really difficult to actually reuse the encrypted login certificate. Then, of course, these registry entries, these registry keys should not be readable for all users. It should, sh ju <clears throat> should just be readable for the user to whom it actually belongs. And then the third point is like, it's a bit strange that the attacker can use his own biometrics to basically 
start a login flow for another user. But I think that's more hard to fix. Basically, step one and two are now fixed on the newest hyper version. And we are basically done. So I looked at three of these products. I'm sure I did not find all vulnerabilities in these three. So there might be still some around. And then there's, of course, other products that implement this. I think there should be parallels between these other products and the ones I looked at. But you know, there's possibly also more vulnerabilities there to be found. Um, these products, basically, they allow a user to, or basically the idea of these products is that end users don't have to enter their passwords as often, so the company can basically ratchet up the password policy. But, of course, passwords or uh, credentials are still very much relevant. Now, the, basically, the problem has been shifted from like the normal user's brain to like this third-party product that now handles the user's credentials. And if there's vulnerabilities in these products, well, they can be abused. They may be abused to basically where a normal privileged user can somehow obtain credentials of another user. And another important point that I think uh, should be mentioned is that, of course, a user that has completely compromised a computer, so has administrative privileges, has now a new way to obtain basically login credentials of other users that have logged into that system. Because, of course, the the administrator can just sort of do exactly the same thing as the service. And I think this is really, this is a bit of a problem because it's, of course, hard to detect. And, yeah. So thank you for your attention. Uh, that's it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, so now we all know how to use or how to not use passwords, I guess. Are there any questions? Wave your hand if you have one. We have Sprinter with the mic. There's one in the front. So uh, you mentioned um, Windows Hello at the beginning. Would you consider that more secure than the products you actually pen tested? Mm. Well, I guess I would say it's more secure, just because, of course, Windows Hello also has less functionality. Uh, but it, I would say it's more secure because, like, your your stuff is really just bound to the computer. So unless somebody gets access to your computer, then and of course, but but there's a caveat, of course, because like these products that I talked about also have more functionality where you can log into any computer. Windows Hello is just bound to one computer. So I think this just naturally means that it's more secure because there's less stuff flying around, there's more or less functionality. I would say that, yeah. Any other questions? Coming there from the back. This is more related to the first two products. Um, with all these yes, no, do you want to log in questions that are spawned from a lot of push notifications? How do you think that users will actually accidentally just press yes if you try it a thousand times or so. Well, obviously, I hope that they press yes all the time because my attack, or at least one of my attacks sort of relies on that. Um, but I, I actually don't really know. I, don't, I, I can't really imagine, or I don't know how it is if you then actually use this thing every day to log in. I don't know if, if at some point you just start just clicking the button. I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? I don't bite. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but in, in Hyper, uh, when the, when an attacker, uh, verifies themselves, he has to send some sort of biometrical di data, right? Yes. To his smartphone or her smartphone. <laughs> and isn't that, is this biometrical data only, uh, is it verifiable by Hyper then? Does Hyper get this data? Because otherwise, uh, well, the attacker would, basically identify themselves if they use their own data. Yeah, so this is exactly what's happening in my attack, because the attacker can just use his own data and start a login flow for another user. And I don't really understand what's going on, because I just, basically that's where I said I treated the app as a black box. Uh, so I just tampered with the parameters in the HTTPS request. And I don't actually know what Hyper is doing here with, the, with this check. Um, because it's, there's some Fido, uh, there's like a Fido string in one of those responses. Uh, so I don't really, I'm not sure what's actually going on, but it's definitely not bound to like a specific user. So it's just like, 
is somebody in front of the, like, is the owner of the smartphone, I guess, in front of the, using the app? I guess that's all that it's actually checking. I hope this answers the uh, question. Last chance for any more questions. Actually, we still have time, so even two questions. Go ahead. Should I go up to the gallery? Any questions from the gallery? I can run up quickly. I don't see anyone waving. Feel free to run, but... <laughs> that was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what would be your recommendation for the um, producers of these tools um, to implement on the server side protective measures like monitoring, logging, to detect such misuse? So you mean like uh, if a company uses this and how they would go about sort of setting up monitoring to detect if somebody's doing these attacks that I'm talking about? So the thing is, I don't actually understand too much about uh, monitoring, so I can't really give you like a detailed explanation. But I guess pretty much just somehow first you have to figure out how to actually attack these products, I guess, uh, which might be difficult. So maybe first like figure out how, how would you actually go about attacking this, so normal user or admin. So how would an, an admin basically attack these systems and then try to figure out if there can be some sort of monitoring setup for that. But like concretely how you would do this is I don't have enough understanding of the subject matter. Um, but just look at, basically look at what the exploit is doing and then figure out what it does, if there's any exploits for, for the product. All right, any more questions? I have a quick question. So on my home computer, I use Fido keys to log into my computer, the little buttons that you can click. Do you have any experience with that, if you can see any any sort of information from that from other users, or do you think that's relatively bulletproof? I guess for the Fido, Fido key, if I understand it correctly, it's basically sort of, it's very similar to the smart card, where basically you, you have your stuff stored on there, and it's just about, you know, like I guess it's like the, the, it's basically just don't lose it or don't plug it into like random places pretty much. I don't know if this answers the question. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's always a good advice. Yeah. Don't lose your stuff and don't plug it into random places. Yeah. <laughs> Especially not at hacker conferences. Um, but yeah, uh, last chance for any questions. Going once, going twice. In that case, let's give another warm welcome and goodbye applause for Philip. <laughs> <laughs>